I will give you the micro and you can start with the, with the talk. Okay, thank you. Hello, here in, we are in Tabacalera and transmitting to grass. Um, I'm going to project an image. And um, so, so my talk is called um, Agropoetics, uh, Amilcar Cabral's Agropoetics of Liberation. And it has a, another title that is called Meteorization, but we can choose. I start with a poem. No poetry, no poetry. Don't you hide in the cave of my being. Don't hide to life. Put down the invisible fences of my poison. Open wide the doors of my being and go. Go to struggle. Life is struggle. The men out there calling for you and you poetry, you are also mankind. Love the poetry of the whole world. Love mankind. Set free your poems for all races, for all things. Fail to distinguish between your body and all other bodies in the world. Confuse yourself with me. Go poetry. Give me your arms to embrace life. My poetry is me. This is a poem by Milka Cabral, 1948. And the name of the poem is also My Poetry is Me. That's how it ends. So I'm going to f talk freely because I, this is based on a research I did and also a paper I wrote. Uh, but in order to make it uh, faster, and uh, I'm going just to speak freely. So we are in 1971. Amilka Cabral is talking in uh, London, in the University of London, to various students. And he's telling uh, about the situation of the war in, uh, in Guinea-Bissau. So we, the situation is that Portugal and Guinea-Bissau are at war since 1963. And Cabral is giving information about the situation to students, militants, uh, um, and uh, uh, people that are interested in the liberation struggles happening in Africa. And he's telling how... Um, the, the war is actually developing and uh, behind the war, so there is in the liberated zones, there are all these schools and um, shops and uh, hospitals that are being created on, and in, in the areas that are called the liberated zones. So Cabral is talking in London and he says the following. The, manual of, the manuals of guerrilla warfare generally states that a country has to be of a certain size to be able to create what is called a base and further that mountains are the best places to develop guerrilla warfare. But obviously we don't have those conditions in Guinea-Bissau. But this did not stop us to begin an armed struggle. As for the mountains, we decided that our people have to take their place. So our people are our mountains. So it's, uh, it's unlikely that the, the, the people that were hearing these words, and in particular this sentence, our people are our mountains, would know that Cabral was actually not only a liberation leader and um, a theoretician and a strategic leader of this struggle, but he was also an agronomist and also uh, soil, and the science of soil was something he was very close at, is actually the material matter of mountains. So, going back um, to, to Cabral's introduction into agronomy, Cabral lived, was, was born in Guinea-Bissau, but very early he, he, he was, um, he grew up in Cape Verde, and uh, after her uh, a daughter's um, biography of his father, of Cabral, uh, he witnessed a, a drought that happened in 1941 in, in, uh, in Cape Verde that killed 13,000 people. And that drought made Cab Cabral, as, I mean, after her daughter, made Cabral decide that he would, uh, he, he would want to study agronomy. So um, his interest for agronomy was also... Um, 
and this is a little bit my argument, was f also uh, to 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 link the what happens in nature, but also how that is also connected with historical and political um, conditions. So what, as, an, as a young agronomist, Cabral uh, goes to Portugal, or as a young student, he goes, he's, he's in Portugal, and he's studying uh, agronomy, and he, he's, uh, he, he focuses on a very specific area in Portugal, that is in Cuba, an area in Alentejo, in the south of Portugal, that it was in that time very eroded and very uh, almost in the verge of becoming a desertified area. And based on these on these on these studies, uh, I I read that Cabral was very interested in searching for various concepts of soil, how you define soil. And um, in, in this introduction to the to this work, he um, he, for example, tested various concepts. One of them was more the more chemical proposition uh, of, of, uh, of, of the definition of soil by uh, Liebig that says the soil is a laboratory in which to, um, to uh, verify various chemical reactions. Uh, another definition that he also uh, found interesting was the uh, kind of more geological uh, perspective, where he would say that uh, actually after Richthofen, where he said that the soil is a pathological condition of the rock. But uh, later, there's another definition that he finds that is from um, Dukushayev, a uh, Russian agronomist, that actually says the, the soil is a, a natural, independent, and historical body. So, and this is uh, maybe the 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 definition that most interests him, uh, that he most uh, could link uh, his perspective. So one of the things that is very interesting is how Cabral is actually... Um, I'm going to change the image. This is actually the image I wanted to have before when he was in London, because this is an image where you see guerrilla people um, looking at the map on the soil of the guerrilla warfare. Um, so Cabral was in this uh, another another interesting point that he puts on uh, in this research is he looks at the soil uh, from the what what he calls it the a, a type a science that is called edophology and edophology is um, a perspective of uh, of soil science that looks at how the soil actually acts on the living beings on top of it so how so it's a, a, a down up perspective. So there's a kind of a subjectivity of the soil and how it actually reacts and uh, influences the bodies living on it. So another uh, element that is very interesting uh, in Cabral's search for definition is he sees the, the, the soil as this kind of conflict zone between lithos and atmos. And lithos is the rock and atmos is the climate. And in this uh, this conflict zone is actually where um, a process of what he called the meteorization is happening and actually uh, where the soil is created. So the rock and the, the climate, rock and climate in this conflict zone actually produces the soil and the produces the basis for uh, life. So this is all elements that I think they are very interesting to reflect and this is something I try to do in um, how Cabral uh, creates a path of, um, of uh, thinking with the soil and also the politics of the soil and how um, this can actually, actually inform later the way he leads the liberation struggle. So um, I will pass to another. The other part that was Cabral was very interested was uh, was in the phenomena of erosion. So the erosion is, not, of course, um, a phenomena of how the nutrients of soil are displaced. So that's the definition: how something is gets out of an ad, from from the soil out of the soil. And um, but this can be um, can have different origins, th this phenomenon. It can be natural phenomena, 
but also can be political and uh, historical phenomena or, or conditions that uh, creates. And in a way, when, he, when Cabral was actually looking at Portuguese soil, there's something very interesting because he focused while actually he was interested in what was happening in in the in in, in Africa and in actions in, in his countries in his two countries uh, the first thing he does is looking at Portuguese soil and there's uh, something that is very interesting he looks at um, the erosion process of Alentejo of the colonizer ground and colonizer soil and he looks at it and he says look you are neglecting your own soil because you are extracting the riches from other places. So basically, he looks uh, at the the erosion of, of Portuguese soil as a kind of uh, result as well of uh, the colonial phenomenon. Um, so later, actually, the the work that he did was uh, even with all these elements that you have to see that he's working in the under the condition of Portuguese of colonial Portugal, and even if he was. Um, even if we, if we can read the in-between critique that is happening in this uh, in his uh, very academic work, he uh, was very successful with this with this work and on on Cuba and uh, was uh, later invited by the foreign uh, by the by the Portuguese overseas ministry to to be, to go to Guinea Bissau and start um, uh, extensive agronomic work in Guinea, like starting the census of uh, the farming practices. And also, um, he uh, started a, a very interesting uh, project that was um, the, the Pesube farm, that is a, a, f a farm that was a, 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 like a, a garden, a colonial garden in, 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 in Bissau, that he, want, he transformed it into, into experimental uh, farming, into an experimental farm. So, um, so this, so this is. We are now 1952. So the the work in in Cuba was happening 1948, 49, and now we are in 1952. And Cabral goes to 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 Guinea-Bissau, and um, and this when when. So I'm just passing this to shorten up. Yeah. So he starts uh, various uh, papers on. Um, on the the what he called the, the in defense of the earth, so how um, and and one of the the other articles he does is uh, he writes is um, the about the the conditions of the soil in, in Black Africa. So how uh, the old practice of um, of uh, uh, the African practice and traditional practice, uh, indigenous practice in Africa are completely different than the ones that were imposed later by colonialism, and how those uh, measures uh, actually changed the the balance um, not only of the soil but also of of people's lives. So he was very, and this is an interesting point because he, um, I'm going to quote a, a part that I think it is very visionary because it links also to situations that we are now living and this is from um, from a paper on on black africa um, uh, farming practice so economical ec economic factors factors in europe europe were one of the causes behind the european settlement of africa after the age of the discoveries with a simple trade in goods including the enslaved black men Europe Europeans spent the rewards of the exploitation of the land. But like black Africans, the aim was to produce essential food. Europeans cultivated or forced black Africans to cultivate farm products. From the contradictions created, African land is being devastated day by day. In a life that is out of balance, obliged to satisfy not only the new demands created by created but the requirements of new society con social conditions, he, the African subject, slowly uproots himself, migrates, or it's forced to migrate. He abandons the land or doesn't have the time to assimilate the knowledge that he has created and accumulated over centuries. The lack of balance in the, in the management of black African soil, 
encourage the emergency of disease that deliberates the human organism. So it's very interesting how Cabral is in 1952 talking already about what actually we are happening, it's happening now, the migrant crisis. And it's, it's already like envisioning that, that this is going to happen due to the, all the conditions that are being created artificially through colonialism. Another um, thing that he later, so we are in 52, but later in, in the, during the struggle, Cabral also s tells something that is very interesting in a speech he's, he's telling to the, to the, to the, uh, to the guerrilla fighters. It's actually the fact that um, he was analyzing, so the time that he had to, while he was working for the overseas ministry as an agronomist, was a very precious time for him to collect a lot of information of how these, all these economical situations are, are, are happening. And one of the examples that it gives is that he was an analyzing the production of peanuts in Guinea-Bissau and how uh, the wages compared with the taxes that people had to pay and and so on, how the, the equation that the, he would make actually was equaling slave work. So basically how, you know, through things that you don't even know that you are paying, and then actually the whole equation was equal to, to slave work with other, with other means. So um, what I have uh, up here is um, a map that I did from this moment that uh, Cabral was actually working as an agronomist from one side, uh, on the, the, the agronomic practice on the left side, and on the right side, the, the cultural and political practice. So basically, you can see how Cabral uses um, the, the mobility as an agronomist in the in behalf of Portugal state to also um, disguise um, a militant practice uh, and that le led later to uh, him becoming the leader of the liberation movement. So basically you can really compare, you know, what he, he was working in, first in Guinea, later in Cape Verde, and then later in, in, um, in Angola, and how all these uh, works that he does for the Portuguese state uh, were also um, often uh, c parallel. There was a cultural practice or a political practice, and, and often the cultural practice was also a form of doing politics. Uh, one of the examples that is very interesting is the House of the Students of the, from the Empire, that was an institution that uh, the Overseas Ministry created in Lisbon, and was a house um, to, with, the, with the aim actually to prepare uh, young academics coming from the colonies to later propagate in their own countries Portugality. So they were they wanted to have good educated um, colonial subjects that would actually continue the empire project. But of course, what happens in the house of the students from the empire, it at, it becomes a place also of subversion and also a place that uh, disguises culture and uh, uses poetry, for example, as a form of communicating as a code to to um, reflect about the conditions and the oppression that was happening in the colonies. Um, so, the, so Cabral, um, after in 19, so in 1959, there is a, a kind of a cut, a very important moment in the, in the, in the, in the history and it's um, a kind of a trigger because uh, while, um, the PAGC was already created in 1956, so the, the party that the liberation, the African Liberation Party that Cabral created. And um, what happens is that uh, also through the PAGC, there is uh, an uprising uh, in the port of PGKT of, of the mer merchant workers that were actually uh, demonstrating peacefully um, against the conditions, uh, working conditions and bad wages. And um, and uh, what happens is a, a massacre that where the Portuguese killed uh, around 80 people in the port. And this basically became the moment where they and Cabral understood that there was no negoci negotiation pro that was possible uh, on, a, on a political basis and, and that he, he would have to start the, the armed struggle. So that's the, the, the verge point. And, and, and so in 1960, 
So one year later, later he himself goes underground and uh, the House of the Students from the Empire organizes the escape, what they call the, the great escape of uh, hundreds of students that actually go uh, escape Portugal uh, through the north direction East Berlin and then from East Berlin to Accra and then from Accra to, to the um, different colonies, um, uh, Guinea-Bissau, um, Mozambique and Angola. So this is to say that um, it's very interesting to understand um, how this path, you know, the agronomic path and the, the, the cultural, poetic and political work were actually always a parallel. That's why, I mean, um, that's why I, we created this word agropoetics of liber liberation because all of these things come together, all this knowledge of the, the, the earth, or the poetry that is also a form of like the for like the poem that I told you in the beginning that it's actually um, also an important factor of imagination and um, and also all this uh, political work. So I'm I'm going back to to the to the to the 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 Pesubia farm because it's very interesting to look at the project that Cabral uh, in 1952 proposes, the program of a farm. So basically this farm was a colonial, a colonial garden that from one side was producing products for the Portuguese or the white population in Guinea, and or also eventually also some what they call the, the civilized uh, Guineans, because there was all kind of like strata, you know, how they, it was a way that, that you would uh, officially become uh, civilized if you, if you had a certain kind of academic degree. Otherwise, you were assimil assimilated or indigenous. So there was all kinds of grades of um, production of uh, otherness. And um, the, the, what I wanted to, t to say is like how the experimental farm the program for the experimental farm that was divided in three proposals. One of the proposal was actually that um, the the farm uh, should be a, a place of research. So it would be it, it would change from a recreational place and uh, food production for the, the 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 privilege to become a place of research of experiment. With, uh, with farming practice. The second was to tear down the hierarchies between the state and the farmers. So it will be a place where the farmers could work uh, freely and would, it, it would be an horizontal uh, structure. And the, second, the, second, uh, the third um, uh, idea and the third proposal was that it would be a place of exchange between uh, farmers from, from the uh, other countries of the region or other areas, so it was a, to be a place also of of um, of bringing people and learning together. So it's a very interesting because it, you can also almost extrapolate uh, the farming, um, the experimental farming uh, um, uh, proposals to you know an art center or today's or even the theory of culture that Cabral envisioned. So. Um, Another element that is uh, uh, very uh, interesting for uh, for me is like in the that was interesting comparing the or like entangling the agronomic work and the the political work was how Cabral was uh, was searching for a kind of a reclamation of language of soil language. So basically, he would um, he, he would through his knowledge and through his experience that he had on the land and uh, he would he would he was proposing to change certain forms uh, certain um, uh, semantics and also some some words one example it's interesting is how he says that uh, guinea bissau has no rivers that the portuguese gave names to the to the old countries but it's a, it's a flat country with 70% of its land and the seawater level. So it's in a permanent tidal mm, change. And actually what you have is what he calls the arms of the sea, because you have salty water until the end of, uh, until uh, dry land. So basically he says that um, the, the Portuguese named 
rivers to those to those arms of the sea, but actually because they don't have an experience of what is an alluvian a land, uh, a flooded land. So he said that we have to change this. Place. So this is an example how we say we have to change the names uh, uh, because it's also a form of reclaiming our land and also reclaiming um, uh, reclaiming the, the 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 language itself. So um, and this is also an argument. It's this this kind of we have to imagine that all these arguments is giving during. He's talking with militant people, or is in the jungle talking with the with the with the peasants that are, and so it's always a form, uh, is a, a form of being uh, connected with the conditions of people's lives, but at the same time um, gaining gaining a, a, a consciousness of the, of these conditions and finding a, a language for it. So another uh, very interesting, I mean, there's many, many examples that I give also in the, in the, in the, in the, in the paper I wrote. Um, that is what he called that uh, the, the, the strategy of a centrifugal movement in the struggle. So basically one of the, the, one of the things is that in, in so the, the struggle starts in 1953 in the center of the country, in a place called Moraes. And uh, Cabral was saying that actually the Portuguese were waiting that, uh, were placing all these um, military forces in the borders uh, with the other countries, you know, with the northern country, with Senegal or with uh, Guinea Conakry, because they were expecting that the Guineans would attack his own land. So this is also, you know, how and, and, and Cabral said, no, no, but we started the struggle in the center because it's also the people's struggle and the people are the mountain, the mountain you need to do the struggle. And they, peop, the struggle will move centrifugal from the center to the borders. So this is also something that was not only strategically very uh, efficient, but also there's an eloquency of, 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 the, of this concept that is both. So the, in a way, like the, the, the situated knowledge that Cabral had of, of, of its uh, relation with the, with the land uh, informs the, uh, the certainty of, of, its, of, its, uh, of the, strat the strategy, of the war strategy. So the, the other, and this is also very interesting because this, I mean, I later make a parallel also with this, uh, you know, revolution is also this movement of the, of the, um, Celestial bodies, you know, like that they, um, it's where the word comes from, you know, the revolution of celestial bodies, but also as a, as a form of um, uh, struggle. So the, the other, just to complete, I don't know, I don't have a, so how are? I have to finish, so I, I'm really uh, doing that. Um, just to, to uh, give you, a later, so one of the interesting things, just to connect also a, with a research that I did previously, is, uh, was a research about cinema and the Guinean cinema. And it's very interesting that the first project that the filmmakers wanted to do, because the, the Guinean filmmakers were trained by Cabral in Cuba, so they were sent by Milka Cabral to Cuba. It's another story, but it's interesting that the first project that they uh, they, they do or that they uh, in, in, and was actually uh, connecting cinema with uh, agriculture. So they had a project called um, Guinea-Bissau six, six years after. So this is actually six years after liberation, 1974. And uh, they are actually shooting, there's a lot of footage, the film was never finished, but one of the proposals of the, of the Institute of, of Cinema that they created in this moment of liberation was exactly that cinema would function as a form of creating an exchange between the different farming practice and uh, and so documenting how uh, people work with the land in the south and showing it in the north and uh, and like that creating an, an exchange so it was a also a kind of a cine cine um, cine agronomy in a way so um i think i i just wanted to close to to explain that 
for me, what is very interesting is not to, was not to do an academic work, even if actually that uh, I, would, I wanted also to think in grass, uh, Shelley Shake and also Rose Gray, because actually they made me take this research and make it into an academic paper. That once was a struggle. I'm not an academic, um, but it was a struggle and it was also very interesting for me. Um, but one of the main uh, interests for me was to think how to look at this, uh, make this research as something that can be useful today. You know, because I think uh, the path that Cabral did from uh, informing all the struggle uh, through looking at the soil and seeing how the soil actually also is a body that speaks and, and that gives you uh, as a subjectivity that, um, that informs uh, uh, what, what is happening on earth and what are the politics and the conditions of people on earth. And uh, so I, I, what, what, what I propose with this is that actually Cabral was already, before the word anthropocenic was invented, you know, maybe 10 years ago, Cabral was already actually thinking in that condition, you know, how the, the condition of the earth and the, the defense of the earth is also connected with the, the, the politics on earth. And, and so um, he informed all this struggle, I think, through this knowledge, and I think they are uh, very inspiring for us also to think today new struggles to um, to fight, uh, you know, the colonialisms that we are living today. So I also wanted to thank just uh, 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 Ahmed Ismaldin that helped me to do uh, this drawing that I, I was <clears throat> basically I transformed the the paper into a drawing on the floor together with Ahmed Ismaldin that uh, actually he uh, made the main the the main conception of this drawing and uh, this was uh, just in August in Savi and I gave the talk actually with the mapping so I just wanted to thank and um, yeah thank thanks to Grass too and to everybody of Vul and uh, Milica and Philip and also here thank you to Calera thank you on for organizing all of this and. I think we have questions now from Grass. Shall we sweep, uh, switch to, to Grass? Um, it's also, um, Sheila is actually present at this conference and we were talking about, or she was also talking about uh, Drumana Mana's Wild Relatives exhibition that was in Tabacalera this summer before your exhibition. So it's great that we now have sort of also the continuation of works from Tabacalera also in the presence here in Graz. And I would like to open questions to the floor. So what questions are there somewhere around? Hello, thanks a lot for this remote presen presence, and uh, which, which for me it's, it's kind of, you know, it's this kind of a remote presence of Cabral in a way of kind of tactically using his time in Portugal in order to develop tactics to think the struggle. And then the prox, the pro proxies, prox, how the pro like this, there are so many proxies actually there in, in your talk, like the the soil, even the river, the non non river rivers, uh, and um, East Berlin as a proxy, and 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 we were earlier today having these different conversations about archaeologies and dr drifting, and it's almost like Cabral through drifting, doing his agronomic work kind of build up his own political strategy of struggle. And, but my, my, my question will be much more mundane. Um, how did you start to work on Cabral? Because you, it was the working actually on the film archive and this also incredible idea of the kind of, of him initiating also a f a film, the film education and the production of film. How was this kind of the way of a kind of entering this topic of then really going back then into also agronomy? And what was the status of if an agronomy was, if if he was using this agrosocial po po poetics in the way of kind of reclaiming colonial 
colonial technique you know, for the struggle, if, how is film collect, collect is this kind of education through film and then filmmaking also a way of reclaiming definition and turning the gaze? Uh, thank you so much for your question. Um, I think um, I can answer this. Uh, I mean, th when I, when I started the the the, the film archive project, uh, that actually I was not expecting to to do such a project. It was really a matter of condition that nobody was <laughs> taking care of it. Um, but uh, I I was uh, reading some of the political books of Cabral or his speeches. And then I decided to go to this bookshop uh, that are is in Portugal that is actually from ex-terrorists, ex-Portuguese terrorists that made this wonderful um, library um, um, bookshop, and I found uh, the, the 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 this tome of um, uh, with a, with a, around fifty, I think fifty-eight, if I'm not mistaken, uh, agronomic works of Cabral. And um, and I didn't. I mean, I knew he was a agronomist, but I didn't know he had done all this uh, uh, proliferous work. You know that he was so proliferous uh, uh, in in his um, researches. And so I basically bought this book and started reading it. it. It's not translated. It only exists in Portuguese. And in a way, I was. Uh, it's very technical. But then I started to understand that if you go slowly and really look into in, in, in between the lines, you find all these very critical, very um, uh, precise uh, um, proposals and um, and uh, views on. Uh, so basically, all of these things that I quoted that are more kind of critical, they are disguised in like longer agronomic um, uh, academic work so um, so then I started to create these links you know like and so basically the you know since 2000 this was 2008 and I started the archive project in 2011 so basically um, the reading Cabral's agronomic work was accompanying al also always this project and and I was uh, of course in um, Starting to also get really interested in the erosion of the film itself, you know, basically the, 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 and and that was starting to become also an interesting element for me, in the research because one of the things that we didn't do was like recovering the films uh, professionally. What we did was uh, basically transferring the films from analog to digital and leaving all the marks and destruction and erosion and diseases film diseases in it as part of the inscription on this material you know like so in a way um the way i was or we were discussing and acting and uh, creating a, an archival practice was also uh, in dialogue with <laughs> you know the the this this um the other this agronomic work of cabral and his interest in Erosion as as an inscription, as a form of uh, also uh, um, reading, you know, the the colonial agency on on soil on people. So um, so for me, it's difficult to disentangle all these the the two researches. They were parallel and they were connected. Um, the the thing with the and 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 of course i think the pro the fact that the project of the film project was so connected with soil i think it is of course based on this idea of course of of, of the the fact that uh the the filmmakers were very based on this very militant idea of of a very specific concept of documentary and the, uh, the documentary from the perspective of uh, almost like uh, Farrokhian, actually. If you look at the text of Faroki, how he think, thinks that actually documentary is not about having an idea and then searching for the image to inform that idea or to make that narrative, but actually go to places, record, 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 and, or film, 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 and collect. And then later you would know what you were going to do with this material. So. The, they are. They are. They are. The idea of, of them was creating an archive. So it's also like, if you can think like a food storage. You know, basically they were collecting footage that and, and collecting uh, that that would serve later for um, creating these exchanges, these farming exchanges. So I think uh, 
I think both researches were parallel and they were not, yeah, it's not possible to disentangle them, yeah. I don't know if I answered, but I <laughs> hope. Um, so, uh, another question that I would have is how, because you were also referring and talking about um, re renaming and basically reclaiming, um, reclaiming also language in, um, in a Portuguese colonial um, uh, perception. So, I was wondering how, um, how language or what kind of language also within this agronomic, agronomic um, project and things, how, how did it work out? How was this language reclaimed also, not just for rivers, but was there also in, in talking and discussing and creating this archive of an agronomic, of agronomic idea also done in, in, the, la in the, la the languages of this, indi of this indigenous, um, um, indigenous uh, uh, context or consciousness, or was this also coming from um, uh, or trying to come from a Portuguese intervention and changing the mindset of the Portuguese colonial perspective? I mean, one, one thing that is very particular in relation to language that I think Cabral was also, again, incredibly effective was the fact that, I mean, you have to see that there's like 32, at least at now, 32 ethnic groups, some are dying out. Uh, and all of them have their own ethnic languages. And um, although until today in Guinea-Bissau, Portuguese is the official language, it is like talked by maybe 2% of the population. So what Cabral did during this process of building, you know, like liberating areas and also um, creating in the, in the back of, of the front uh, these schools was actually to... Uh, propag to, to propagate the Creole language. So basically it's a, it was a language that was already being used uh, in the past, but it was mainly spoken in, in, the, in the cities. Uh, but basically he was able, and this is really unique, he was able to put you know, like 70% of the population speaking Creole in, in 11 years of, the, of war. While the Portuguese were 500 years around those areas and nobody speaks Portuguese. So this is very interesting how actually basically he uses Creole because Creole uh, in many other places, for example in Brazil, is very negatively, there's a negative connotation because it's like an imposed language by the Portuguese itself. So basically in this case was really the, the language for the struggle. So it was a language that uh, could connect different ethnic groups and where actually the language, uh, that's why the project was, the, the, one of the elements of the theory, theory, of co theory of culture of Cabral was actually through cinema and through Creole to create a kind of unity, uh, f you know, to, to liberate and also to continue a nation, like to create a kind of sense of uh, unity, of national unity. So another element concerning um, language that I think it's, uh, uh, it's interesting is, um, uh, for example, Cabral, there's also like in one of the speeches that's actually from a film that we recovered, that is actually the, the film that, uh, that, was, that we were searching and finally found it was the, the Return of Emilio Cabral is considered now the first Guinean film from 1976. And, uh, and in this film, uh, it's a very interesting film because the film itself is really an animistic film. You know, it's about the return of Cabral's body to, to the country where it can be buried. So basically, it's a film that says if we can bury our dead, you know, because Cabral was assassinated in 1973, just one year before uh, the liberation, we can also also return to the land. So also this idea that uh, if you can, uh, if your soil can accommodate your people, you can also return and live on it. And um, and and so the, the in this film, the Return of Emilio Cabral, there's a speech that he gives to the to the to the teachers, to, in the the guerrilla teachers that are all with the uniforms, in a circle, and they are hearing Cabral. And one of the things that he he says is uh, he makes a kind of a de declension of the word fear. He says it's not the Portuguese our enemy, it's not the enemy is our fear. And basically he is decomposing the word fear, you know, like really like fear of this, fear of the, of the, uh, of the dark in the forest, fear of, it's very poetic, but it's like, it gives like 10 declensions of the word fear. Um, 
and and how uh, it's very interesting because fear is actually the political weapon per se. You know, like it's the propaganda weapon. And actually, he was trying in that um, in that speech uh, to say that the, the the teachers are the frontline guerrilla people because they are the ones that are going to fight the the big the big enemy that is the fear created in people. So basically. I mean, I don't know how this has to do with language, but really the, how Cabral was operating language, maybe. And, and um, yeah, it's also another. I mean, there's more elements that can, don't come to my mind now, but um, I think he was, um, this idea of a reclaiming, you know, it's also the word reclaiming soil is also recovering soil after exhaustion, after the erosion, but also reclaiming and creating new languages. You know, it was not only about bringing back something that was lost uh, in a very, like, that this could bring another, a kind of um, et ethnicity idea that you have to go back to a kind of past uh, um, ethnic uh, uh, conditions of life. But so it was about creating something new, you know, but uh, something that was also a reclaiming. Thank you, Philippa. And I think we are now also um, at the end of our session with you. Really, thank you also and Tava Calera for this really great intervention. And yes, so thank you and just. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye, -bye cha -cha. Enjoy we your can, evening. We can switch off the Skype connection and maybe here we can also make some open up here because we were so focused on them and not so much on you. Like, I have a microphone. Um, thank you very much for this very inspiring uh, talk. Uh, I was wondering about uh, if there is anything in this history that is on the people that's around Cabral that could have been of uh, support to his ideas or perhaps they that did some of the research or some of the thinking. Or was it all the work of one of this person, one person, the leader? Um, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I also dislike this idea of like um, making Cabral this kind of hero. And um, I think he didn't do things alone. And he also had a very strong and intelligent woman uh, next to him, uh, Maria Elena. And uh, also, I think. Um, I, I don't know, because this is the thing, you know, like I, I basically based all this research on his writings and not so much on, because there's a lot of biographies and there's a lot of things that, I mean, I, I first I wanted to focus on only on his voice and not so much on, because there's a lot of trash being published as well. I mean, I, I tried so one biography and then I was really not liking how you really see like uh, political tendencies that are, and of course, is always. I have also my own political tendencies, also and and distortions and um, projections and wishes and eventually fabulations as well. Uh, uh, but uh, of course, I mean, I think I think he was a very charismatic person, an incredible hard worker. I mean, he's someone that wrote proliferous and even the struggle. I think. I read that he would sleep very little and write all night, and uh, you know, like he was someone that he was on a, a kind of a on drugs, you know, for <laughs> for this militant work. But then he, I mean, he has incredible, there's incredible, wonderful people. For example, if you look at the House of the Students for the Empire, uh, there's, I mean, there's all researches around that. It's amazing. It's like hundreds of brilliant students and poets and uh, thinkers and also women um, that were writing and they were you know like in this movement and also how I mean I also read some of the um, of the political police uh, the P the P that was this political police that was a secret police that was actually sneaking around during dictatorship and uh, it was actually this this um this state police was actually holding this 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 dictatorship because it was all about sneaking and and uh, finding uh, you know people that would uh, um 
uh, be bought and uh, so basically and if you look at the at the, the these reports they have not you know like they are not able to decode you know so they they say oh there was this meeting they were reading this poem but you know you see how they are puzzled and not really able to to really understand what was being uh, done in the in the underground um, in the, of that organization uh, what is was immense was immense because they were uh, basically um, funded by the state and um, uh, doing this and I mean there's also this concept by Fred Mott and, and uh, Stefano Arne on the under comments today like how to use the university against the politics of the university by doing underground work you know like basically they were doing the same but in 1958 1956 and and um and of course, it was a group. You know, it was not uh, one sole person. It was a group of people, and and then, um, otherwise, this would have been impossible. And actually, that there's also incredible stories of uh, people. The the people that because Cabral was basically always from the moment that he had to go underground I, after the Pinjigiri massacre in 1960. He was never anymore. He didn't put his feet in Guinea. I mean, uh, he put his feet in Guinea in the in the liberated areas, but not in the controlled areas from Portugal. So basically, the the people there was a lot of militants that were infiltrated in the system, in the Portuguese system, and actually doing the um, how you say there's a word for that. The um, there's a word that I like. Uh, Getting, getting militants, you know, like recruiting, exactly doing the recruitation of of people, and this was this was the big work because that was the really you know groundwork and the most sensitive one because and this was done by an, w one of the main recruiters were Rafael Barbosa. He was an incredible human being that actually was punished from all sides on the end, you know, because. Uh, the fact that he was uh, doing the recruiter work, but he had to also to be in the in the A zone that they called the A's, the A zone was the Bissau, and uh, and uh, he he was the person um, that uh, that had to be you know playing two roles you know in a very and later you know like when the and later he's he's being punished by the own party you know after Cabral is dead. He, Cabral was the person that could um, protect him because he was in, he was in touch with him very closely. But later, they would say, "Oh, he was actually working for the Portuguese too." So it's very complex. It's a very complex <coughs> process and very brutal on the end, in a way. So, just to thank you very much for uh, this presentation. Very uh, interesting. Just to follow up on uh, in the comment and question of uh, Allah. Um, actually, the when I, I hear this, because I worked on the African independences, and I see a strong link of uh, Cabral with Franz Fanon and his development of ergotherapy in the psychiatric hospital in Algeria, and all his writing and and seeing of. Um, of uh, the development of uh, uh, cultivating the soil. And so uh, what I mean is that also this, uh, if you follow the, the, cart the cartography of uh, traveling of uh, Cabral within Africa, all the hospitality and the, he, he got all around, you can see the contamination of the thinking that he developed throughout a, a it's all these ideas are the ideas developed in collaboration, like cross-national, uh, transnational, uh, um, third world ideas, and uh, also uh, the roads to independence, and the language, the soil, all this uh, vocabulary, and the development of uh, this vocabulary towards um, uh, feeding the uh, notion of culture that we see uh, in the um, the festival of uh, the World Festival of Black Art uh, in uh, Senegal or the Pan African Festival, it's, it devil it continues there. And I think Cabral died in 70, uh, 73 or no, uh, yes, uh, Fanon died earlier. But there's we can see in the poetry and uh, uh, his uh, speeches and his writing also the contamination of a whole uh, uh, effort of a continent. Uh, uh, 
and leaders or militants that he meets uh, uh, throughout uh, his uh, traveling and uh, meeting in Algiers or meeting in Tan Tanzania. Very important what you say about the language, uh, uh, the Swahili as well, how Swahili became exactly the same as the Creole uh, in Cabo Verde or, or in... Uh, so they were also very much uh, uh, all Southern Africa hosted in uh, Dar es Salaam and uh, uh, discussing uh, 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 these um, similar uh, struggles and uh, how to uh, uh, take over uh, the land beyond the, the um, armed struggle. And, and there I want to speak about what you said, the women, the role of women. Women had a really strong... Uh, 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 make a, a big effort in the land, in the nation, and in the motherland, in education and in uh, uh, transmitting the language. Uh, so uh, that was uh, yes, and, yes. And, uh, in the also in the in the in the there was a rule of the political bureau in the struggle that the the, the political committees there was you know like there was areas uh, of the struggle and each area had to have a five head. Uh, um, pol political committee and these co committees they had to be at least two women in five people at least otherwise more so they were really also empowered and this was a rule Cabral put in like in order to not also it was also a uh, uh, um, an answer to the beginning, uh, you know, there was this moment where they would liberate the areas and then start you know, so abusing women, you know, like there was also this kind of like, oh, we are so you know, energized by the in our masculinity as guerrilla fighters, and then we are going to do exactly what the Portuguese were doing. You know, like or you know, like and th there was these moments where that's why there is a um, the Casaca. Um, the, the very soon, like after two years of the struggle, there is a um, the first congress, and there is a really huge punishment huh? and executions also because of these kind of things that happen in the war. And so they had to, and and then they created all these rules, you know, like and of empowerment of women um, in the struggle. But to back to the, also this cultural element, for example, there's there's something that is fascinating. Just an example, Cabral, in 1973, just three months before he was killed, in September 1972, sorry, he's killed in uh, uh, 20th of January 1973. Uh, he he makes an exhibition. <laughs> as a curator really like he makes an exhibition so curators here in the room um where he's showing um the the state of the war so with maps and photos and also like um, uh, 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 weapons from the portuguese ex exhibited like what they actually captured it's really an immense it's like in the in the in conakry in the in the uh, Palais de, de Peuple, uh, the People's Palace of Conakry, and and they make this um, this exhibition. You know, like it's really it looks like a contemporary art exhibition. You know, with maps and information. You know, it's look very close to what uh, what uh, what you see today <laughs> in exhibitions. And he was doing that. You know, like he did an exhibition, and then uh, it was called the, the Week of Information. And there was this exhibition, and then there was also like cultural events, and also there was. Um, uh, writings uh, into the like visits to the different uh, headquarters of the PHSA in Conakry because they were based there, like the storage of military uh, clothes and uh, the you know the people sewing the clothes and uh, so it's really like um, a week of like we are showing how we do war, you know, like <laughs> it's very 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 interesting, very particular. So. Um, Yes, of course, and Cabral was in these meetings, and he was... Uh, the other thing that I wanted to add is, is the animistic element that is also important. Cabral, I mean, um, although he was envisioning something to the future that was not going back to the past, because it's something you can't really recover, but it was a reclaiming and not a recovering of the past, but the reclaiming of, of something new, but through a kind of s subjective, you know, like situated point of view. But at the same time, for example, he... In some of his speeches, he also talks about this. Um, I mean, he really recalls, you know, like the forces, the the, the 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 animistic forces as also part of the struggle. You know, like they they said, like there was, for example, these two areas, Kobiana and um, Kinera, that are a magical forest full of balobas of sacred areas, and 
and the, 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 the militant didn't want to go inside of this forest. But then Cabral had to say, no, no, but the Irans, you know, the sacred entities, they are with the struggle, they are with us, so they will protect it. So we have to go and, in, into these places, in this area. So basically he was not also not, you know, like, um, he was also wanting to make a merge of all these, uh, all these elements also because in a way, you, you can, and I propose that also in the text, that some of the this idea of like looking at the soil as some kind of agency that has an intentionality, talks about intentionality of the soil, uh, it's also like an animistic view of, 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 uh, of an animistic perspective. So basically he was, you know, like even if, you know, from this very scientific perspective, also uh, allowing some kind of animistic elements that I think it can, uh, I think it's part of something that it's very inspiring for us to to rethink also what we lost, you know, in our animist cultures through illuminism, through uh, you know um, uh, inquisition, and so, so we lost a lot of all this relation, uh, animistic relation. To, even if we are animistic, but you know, like uh, we lost this this allowance of 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 um, uh, watching or being having this, uh, allowing us to, to, to accept this, this possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Filipa. I, I want to ask you about the reception of your work in Portugal, not necessarily in oh, the okay. art stand, Don't but I mean, uh, I mean, the question is more complex. Um, is uh, nowadays figure uh, the figure of Cabral creates some incommodity, or there is a historical revision, or how how is how do you feel this thing? Cabral's fever, why I don't, didn't heard about it. I mean, is this <laughs> but is historical it, perspective you are presenting? Uh, mm, what mean, what is the reception in Portugal uh, about this? Uh, uh, I mean, because in Spain is I mean, I think crazy. there's a lot this, of uh, things this. going on in Portugal that I'm very ignorant about. I know I know from friends that, and I I know a lot of activists and artists and curators that are doing wonderful work, and I know that. Um, there's a lot of things changing. And uh, I know, for example, that the first time I presented something connected to this was in Jeu de Pomme in 2012, was the first time that I used the book of Cabral as a kind of like departing point to think. Uh, but I don't know, um, I, I'm a little bit ignorant. I know that there's a lot of things being hap happening in Portugal that are very interesting. You know, also if you look at, you know, having now three Guinean women in the in the in the parliament uh, uh, of Portugal, and so there's a lot of, and I think this is the moment of change. You know, like the moment where people get really into power. Not only like the, st the struggle is the main, th the struggle has to be done, but then you feel the difference when when these uh, things are happening. And um, and Portugal, I mean, it has. I have a very con uh, conflict relation with Portugal because in a way I had to go out in order to be able to think it, you know? And so I have this uh, kind of trauma with that place, but I, I always go and do something and go back <laughs> away. I live since 22 years away from Portugal. But I'm very, and, and, and I respect a lot the wonderful work that people are doing on the ground and, um, and the struggles that are being done. And I think finally, finally what is happening is that people are, slowly allowing to understand that, that Portuguese is a very Creole country in its old condition and construction. And, and, and this is happening now because the people that have been oppressed all the time are finally coming to the fore. And this is of course now also Cabral and you know, like are becoming part of the, the discussion and of looking to back into history, I think. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Uh, no, in, in many African post-colonial countries, um, still seems a problem the land reform. So my question: I have no idea in Guinea Bissau what happened there after after independence, after the liberation, or how was it before? Uh, how was the land distributed? 
before before deliberation and after or what was uh, Cabral's uh, proposal? Um, I mean, it's many questions together. Uh, but one, I mean, one that is interesting that the the land law. It's very interesting because you can't really buy land in in, in Guinea Bissau. You can lease it for 1990 years. What is actually a, a result of this? What is very interesting? You can get it for 1990 years and uh, eventually extend it on. Um, but uh, the 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 situation in Guinea is very complex and very. I mean, I don't know. I think. They have seven, eight coup d'etats in the past 40 years or more. I don't know. Can't count them anymore. And they are in the verge of, like, again, uh, the government is in the verge of collapsing again. Uh, it was just elected in um, June, past June. So it's a very unstable. And it's not, and it's always, always uh, the international. Uh, pressure that is like happening around those the West African coast. Basi basically, it's always, you know, like it's a mi mixture of like uh, pressure from Senegal, from the the cartels of, of cocaine that and also the mafia of China. The So basically there's the countries completely under uh, pressure from all these ex external forces. And what is interesting is that the people are left to themselves basically almost you know they are left alone and then there is this kind of i think 80 percent or 90 percent of the money that enters the country is from international aid and in, and it's also this all these like very problematic relation of you know ngo systems that are basically you know only a new a new form of neocolonialism uh even you know like um, I know there's a lot of people with good intentions, and I sometimes I also work with with them. But of course, this is a completely fake. I mean, nobody, everybody knows that these countries would never go anywhere with the aid of, of, of. Uh, it's just a way of keeping, you know, the the problem, uh, in the, you know, as it is. But it doesn't go anywhere. So, um, and the, the so this is a very complex thing. What what I think for me, it's very interesting to work there. Is to work with these people that still have, I mean, for me, working with the filmmakers and also now working with a group of young, um, young uh, Bijago people that actually were organized by Sananada, that is this filmmaker, this militant filmmaker uh, I work with on the archive project, uh, is that uh, uh, there is um, there is a lot of, you know, there's a huge forces now to to take over, you know, the rest of indigenous lives that exist there, you know, like the, you know, people if mainly in these islands that are 80, 80 islands in the Atlantic that with a very particular animistic culture that is b being threatened from all sides. And, and this group is trying to at least create a kind of a language also to, to deal with it. Um, but of course, it's like uh, and and what I'm what is very interesting for me is also the fact that you can learn so much from these people. You know, like you, they have a relation with nature that um, th that is actually uh, against you know like accumulation against extract. You know, they extract, but they extract on a on a level that 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 is never putting pressure on the resources. They they talk about that you don't put pressures on the resources. You you keep it balanced and also. Their religion is also a form of sac they sacralize nature, and how everything all all beings are are sacred some more than others. But and also the area there's areas that are sacred because there's a reproduction phenomena there. So all this cosmology of how they basically they are a, a, a religion of um, nature protection. So I think you know like all this <laughs> climate change and I mean. The, the thing is for me, and this is also, I, I was talking with Elisabeth Povinelli from the Caribbean Collective, and she said something very interesting that I think is inspiring. You have all these white people, you know, like looking at climate change and like looking at the apocalypse coming, <laughs> you know, to them, and they are building walls. So the people that are coming from those places, the apocalyptic places, don't come, you know, with the, with the, you know, with the crisis that is approaching. But actually the apocalypse is there. It's already there. 
It happened already. It's not that it's the future. You know, it happened, and to these people it happened for sure, and they are living it. You know, the indigenous people are living the apocalypse. They were, they thrown from their lands, they were expropriated, they were exploited, they were enslaved, they were, you know, like, so the apocalypse happened to them. And we are now looking and saying, like, climate change, oh, this is horrible, but it, it's not horrible, it's actually a fact, and it was produced through all this phenomena. So, these people are in these conditions, you know, they are in the apocalypse, living it. Guinea is one of the examples in many, you know, Amazon, Polynesia, whatever, Syria. <laughs> no. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.